Okay. I feel like Mike Walsh, half the room probably doesn't understand that. Okay, <laughs> welcome everyone. Um, this is, this, uh, this is uh, meant to be a, a thing called the President's Panel uh, where we have senior executives and we've tried to grab people who are um, representative of major sectors of, of the cruise industry. Um, most people may not be familiar with Francesco who's uh, come all the way from South America. Is that right? Yep. Uh, so Aqua Expeditions. Can you just give us, you know, one minute? Tell us, tell us your life story in one minute, Francesco. <laughs> okay. Um, everybody hear me? Yes. Well, thanks for having me, first of all. Um, it is my first time in, in an event of this sort, but I think my presence here obviously, you know, confirms our focus on this market. Um, Australians have become an ever-increasing important sector for us. I started the business seven years ago, well, actually 12 years ago in the Galapagos Islands. Uh, that's where I fell in love with small ship cruising. I'm Italian-American. I'm actually now based in Singapore, and we'll go into that a little bit more, but just to confirm, obviously, our interest in the potential and future growth of our business in this part of the world. But I did come from Lima. I started Aqua Expeditions um, six years ago, building the first boat. It's a small luxury expedition vessel cruising in the furthest inland seaport of the world, actually, in Iquitos. Iquitos, Peru is um, on the Amazon River, in the Peruvian Amazon. And it's the further, biggest city in the world disconnected by roads. So the only way you can get there is by flying or cruising there. And the Aqua is operating now five years. The Aria we launched two years ago is 16 uh, suites, 32 guests. And now I'm in this part of the world building our new cruiser on the Mekong, which will launch this September. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we've just heard some amazing statistics from Christine. Um, and, and yes, the, the official clear st statistics show that Australia's grown 130%. We're the fifth biggest market in the world, the fourth uh, in terms of deployment. So can I ask um, any or all of you, in fact, all of, all of you can give me a sort of a, a short answer to this. Why is it growing so fast? Is this a fad? Is it a bubble? Is it sustainable? How about you, Gavin? Appreciate that, uh, Bruce. The, uh, I didn't get the body language that I was going to go first, but I, uh, <laughs> I uh, appreciate that. Look, I, I think the, um, the excitement of the industry is about consumer choice. So the cruise brands of the world uh, are sending their ships to Australia. So for the, uh, the toil and heartache and hardship of that post-migrant era, um, of upgrading ships, um, we've seen the consumer choice arrive. And so more than ever before, we've got more brands here in Australia. And I think that's breeding success because in every retail store uh, that a consumer or a family is going into, they have choice. And it's really that choice that creates both the competition, the variety, the difference amongst um, all of the uh, onboard experience and product. Um, that's creating the enthusiasm and the energy uh, within households of Australia to seek cruising. The other point I'd make is that everybody's doing a great job. So all of the cruise lines that are operating here in Australia are first world competent and capable businesses um, that uh, conduct responsible and successful cruise operations in this region. So that again is building confidence and building a, um, building a conversation again across the back fence uh, down the high street uh, that's, that's growing and adding support to the interest in the cruise category. Thanks. Um, Jeff, do you want to have a go? Um, yes, Jeff McGarry. Well, I, I really speak on behalf, I suppose, of the river ships and uh, small expedition vessels, which is uh, our specialty. Uh, most people in the audience would be aware of the brands that APT uh, have in Australia. Uh, you may not be aware, and I'm just telling you this so that you know, I have got a bit of a background of information to make a comment on. Uh, we're a major shareholder in um, Ama Waterways in the US and, of course, Noble Caledonia uh, with our Swedish partners based in London, which is the largest um, expedition ship operator in the UK. And um, uh, where, what I put it down to, uh, this and I would believe the growth in that small ship area is probably even a, could be a greater percentage, I put it down to the uh, retirees, the older market that um, have fallen in love with this cruising, particularly the river ship cruising, um, and, and just absolutely fallen in love with it. And uh, uh, the medical profession's patching us all up. 
uh, I say us, because I'm just about in the age bracket. Only trouble is I haven't quite retired, have I? Don't think I ever will. Um, and, uh, you know, new, new stents in the heart, new hips, new <laughs> knees. This is... I, I've been in this uh, business with 50 Steve years. Austin. And I tell you what, I reckon we're getting these people now for 10 or 15 years longer than I got the retirees 50 years ago. So it's no wonder we're having to build ships and do all of this. That's, that's enough for me. Good on you. <laughs> OK, Anne. And And um, what are you seeing in your business and uh, in terms of demographics <laughs> growth? <laughs> is it going to continue? You made the outrageous claim that, you know, it'll be a million by 2020 and we're well, we're well past that. We're nearly there. We're nearly there. Um, what do I think it is? I, I mean, we clearly have a very broad suite of brands and therefore offering. So uh, while those having stents uh, are part of that market, uh, a lot of the growth we're seeing is in the big the biggest segment of travel really in Australia, which is that middle family market. And that's the group that have been turned back on to cruising. You know, once they did uh, go on ships occasionally, they, uh, you know, it was a much more expensive in the, hey, in the early heyday of cruising. I think we've created a new heyday of cruising where it's affordable, it does now compete with uh, a con you know, any other sort of holiday choice, which is why our penetration is growing so quickly. Uh, we do have great product, as Gavin said. Uh, I've, I said actually uh, quite a few years ago, apart from the million, which everyone thought I was on drugs at the time when I said it, but, um, uh, and in fact, I think, to Christine's point about penetration, I think we should be targeting 10%. We live on the sea, people see the ships, you know, there's an incredible draw that we can bring to our segment because we're so visible in the major cities of Australia and New Zealand and, in fact, around the whole region. Um, but I think the other part of it is that it's become fashionable again. You know, it was very unfashionable for a while. It was only uh, people who had months of time to spend, and they're a, clearly an important market after they've had their stents and their hips done, <laughs> uh, and uh, all their faces lifted or whatever it is. Uh, those, I mean, that's a very important segment, but the really big growth segment, I think, for us, and the continuing big growth segment, is that real, is that middle market. You know, families with kids, couples, people wanting to get away just for a few days as well as for a few months. You know, all of the, the offerings now, the breadth of the offering, means you're not trying if you can't find a cruise that suits you. Your price point, your destination, your time, uh, you know, whether it's a small ship or a large ship, whether it's a, a luxury ship or it's a contemporary ship, whatever it is, there is now something available. And that's a fantastic offering, both for you guys as trade, but also it's a fantastic offering into the market. So I think it's the fact that it's something for everyone and that everyone can find their product and their space and their price point. And I don't think it's a bubble or a fad. I think. Uh, there are very few markets in the world that have got the sort of growth that we've got. Uh, it will come also to our north. I mean, we know that at some point, uh, other than the great work that Singapore is doing, that Asia will ignite. And of course, that's our time zone as well. So I think there's, a, there's massive leverage, even as I look out 10 or 20 years for us, when we work our time zone uh, in a way that, you know, perhaps North America has for a long time, that we, we still have so much more opportunity available. And Francesco? Well, similar to what Jeff said as well, our client base is, um, I'd say, it's multi-generational, obviously. The size of our vessels caters to a different um, market segment, which are soft adventure travelers. So even though they're soft adventurers, and upwards of 55 and up, but we get a lot of multi-generational buyouts, private charters, the size of our vessels obviously caters to that but also soft adventure travelers. And our clients are really coming from, these are clients that have done African safaris, uh, Antarctica expeditions, uh, tiger camps in India. They're really people that don't want to sacrifice any of the creature comforts that they've come to expect on any world-class properties, but want an adventure from what I, what I call nine to five adventure. They're willing to go out and go piranha fishing in the morning and go um, you know, um, excursions into floating markets in Cambodia and Vietnam, but note that at the end of the day, that adventure is kind of turned off and have a f fully air-conditioned vessel, fine dining experience. But, you know, and that, that's what they're looking for. That's the type of clients. They're willing to rough it during the day, but at night they want their happy hour, and they want 
And then that's the type of clients we're catering to. So we're very specific, we're very niche oriented, we are small, but we're very focused. And, um, and we've done that with the design of our vessels and with this onboard service that we can you know, address a little further on. So. Okay, thanks. Now, um, and you mentioned uh, you know, that it's back in fashion. A couple of years ago, you might not have said that when we saw Concordia you know, on the rocks and that sort of thing, and, and that story has languished on and on. Have, what, have we recovered from that? Have, you know, did it affect your business, Gavin? Did it affect your business? Um. I think, I mean, globally it certainly did. But I, I think in, uh, in Australia we were more resilient because we'd had our own set of issues here as well. And uh, uh, I think we'd grown confidence in the market that we knew what to do. But again, as Christine mentioned earlier, you can't be complacent. We're now a big business. We carry a lot of people. Uh, we've got a lot of media spotlight on us. If anything goes wrong, whether or not we could have done anything about it is irrelevant. It becomes a story. So I think the, uh, uh, we are res more resilient than perhaps we once were, but we can't be complacent. We've got to be on the front foot all the time. We've got to be talking to stakeholders. We've got to be managing public perception of the industry. We've got to be talking about the good things. Uh, in some ways, cruising, and when I first started in the business, cruising was probably the best kept secret in Australia. So you can't have it as the best kept secret. You've got to have it out there as, uh, as an industry that's robust, that can uh, acknowledge mistakes, fix them, uh, and move on to the next thing and manage that actively. And I think uh, that's why, you know, Gavin and I have both been obviously very active in the creation or the, trans, uh, the movement of ICCA into CLEAR because we do need now to step up to be a, an industry and behave like a proper industry and manage ourselves like a really um, confident and robust industry in this market. And I think that's a huge positive. And what about you, Gavin? Did you see a hit? Well, look, the, the loss of life is, is a tragic event and, uh, and that makes it relevant to uh, everybody who's, who's a, a vacation or someone who takes a holiday because that, that's what brings it home to everybody's heart. Um, the second part of that story is that the, you know, the ship is still there, it's still on YouTube, it's still uh, part of a community that's being discussed around the world. What it's done to the industry, it's been a, a unifying event. So uh, CLIA has uh, gained uh, great momentum from the requirement of cruise lines to behave and act as one. Uh, to unilaterally adopt operating standards, adhere to uh, regulation on a global basis. <coughs> Excuse me. To work in with the IMO um, and to improve the competency and the capability of the global association. So that's been the industry's response and I think at no other time um, has the industry been as collegiate as an operating uh, organisation. We still fiercely compete obviously in, uh, in the commercial world but as operators we are, we are united. The impact on Australia, uh, I mean, there's been um, a, a, a very strong understanding that the proximity to that event uh, has been, um, uh, the closer you get to that event, has been the greater of the um, economic impact to the cruise industry. Um, obviously, the nationalities that were directly affected through the loss of life have, uh, have similarly um, had difficult trading conditions. The Aussies are a robust lot, of course, and, uh, and we kind of sit in one corner of the globe and look at everybody else doing things on the other side of the world. Um, and so we do have a degree of remoteness. And that event is also contrary uh, to the competency and the style of product that's coming into Sydney and Australia. So um, there's a tangible reinforcement of uh, the access to the world's most quality cruise lines uh, because they're here in Sydney or Melbourne or Fremantle or, or wherever they're going. So it is a simmering issue uh, whilst ever that ship uh, sits there and whilst ever uh, the loss of life is uh, celebrated and recalled, it'll be an issue for the industry for time to come. Okay, thanks. I just wanted to um, switch tacks a bit and talk about marketing and for you, Jeff, particularly, Anyone who watched the tennis, um, you know, must be about to book an APT cruise because every blessed ad break there was an APT ad. How much did you spend marketing? Uh... <laughs> I was very careful not to ask that question because <laughs> I think I'd get too upset. But um, yeah, for what my friends were saying the same thing to me, and uh, certainly the phones were ringing their, their head off. Um, but. Um, I think it's it's just part of the demand for for the um, this this cruising phenomena. I mean, I've never seen the likes of it in 
I've been around a long